All right, in this video, we're going to be talking about justifying our answers on free response for calculus A, B. And so I'm going to start with the relative extrema. Now, a relative extremum is like a relative maximum or a relative minimum. It's going to be a place where we have a sign change in the first derivative. And the first derivative test is where we're really we're being explicit about the nature of that sign change. So sometimes, you know, we're maybe given a graph and we're asked to determine where is there, you know, a, a minimum in this case. And so, I don't know, I'll just ask you all, where, where are you seeing, what x value do you think there's going to be a minimum on the graph of g? Yes, yes, x equals 2. Yes, okay. So I'm going to say at x equals 2, but this, today we're talking about justifying our answers. So really the thing that we're interested in is the because. Okay. And now we're pretty solid at using the first derivative test. I would say because g prime of x, now since this one is one that's a function that's defined by an integral, I like to make sure that we're going to be really explicit about what is the derivative of g. And in this case, what is the derivative of g? Yes, g prime of x is f of x. Okay. And so I like to always write g prime of x, which I know is f of x, goes from negative to positive. And, you know, ideally we're writing out the words negative and positive, but sometimes we don't have much time, right? It's coming down, the clock is ticking down on our free response, and we just need to put down an answer. And so I'm going to just, and throughout this video, I will be highlighting in yellow the justifications here. Now, one thing that is, I don't think this is every free response question ever, but I did grade one last summer that had this come up, where if you said that x equals 2 was the relative minimum, that lost you the justification point because x equals 2 is the location of a relative minimum, which I thought was a little picky, but I understand what they were saying. And so that's probably not something I would charge you for in my class, you know, if you wrote x equals 2 is a relative minimum because g prime, which is f, goes from negative to positive. But I will let you know that that might not be acceptable on, on the AP exam. We also need to be able to do this for algebraically defined functions. So for something like f of t equals this third degree polynomial, find where it's got a relative maximum. So I know that that's going to require a derivative. That's going to be 6t to the 2 minus 6t to the 1 minus 12. And then if I want to find where I'm sign changing, I need to figure out where it's equal to 0. So I'm going to have to factor. So I'm going to factor out a 6, and I'll be left with a t squared minus t minus 2. And I'm realizing that I can go even farther with that. I can say t minus 2 and t minus 1. And then I'm going to make myself a little number line. Oh, whoops, pardon me. And I'm going to either sketch the graph of the derivative, or I'm going to make a sign chart. Okay, with this one, I know what the graph of 6t squared minus 6t minus 12 looks like. It's a parabola that opens upward, and it's pretty narrow. But I don't really care how narrow it is, because all we care about is where it's positive and negative. So I'm going to draw something that looks like a parabola, you know, and that's going to tell me, I know f's going to have a relative maximum anywhere where f's derivative goes from positive to negative. And that appears to be happening here at x equals negative 1. Okay. So I'm going to say at x negative 1, and my because is because f prime goes from positive to negative. You mean right here? Yes, that should definitely be a positive 1. Or, that should be a positive one, not the zero. Yeah, I made a factoring error. Okay. But I've done this problem like four times today, so. Okay, so that's, that's what it would look like algebraically. Again, our reason being because f prime goes from positive to negative. And that's the first derivative test. Let's talk about the second derivative test. Seems like this year, y'all really like the second derivative test. I've got people actively choosing to do the second derivative test, sometimes even when it's inappropriate. And... That's where we're best off using the second derivative test in a situation like what you see below. That's where we're saying, okay, the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive. 
meaning it must be flat while smiling. That's a minimum. That's the idea. Okay. But I do have a significant portion of my people that are, for whatever reason, really hesitant to, rem to be super explicit about the fact that dy dx equals zero. And that is the first step to using the second derivative test. If the derivative is not zero, then the function is in the midst of increasing or decreasing and therefore could not be at an extreme. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to start by taking dy dx at the point six and five. So I'll say at the point six five is equal to six times y minus five times x. And I'm going to say that that equals zero. And I'll have more to say about the justification here in a second because this one's actually a little touchier, I feel like. Now, I need to take the second derivative. I need to do it implicitly. And so I'm just going to take it in general. What would be the if I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. What would be the derivative of 6y with respect to x? 6 dy dx. Yes, it would be 6 dy dx. And then... I know the derivative of 5x is 5, so it would be 60y dx minus 5. And now, if this was a situation where the question had called for you to find the second derivative of y with respect to x both times in terms of x and y only, that's where we would need to substitute on that and with the 6y minus 5x. But that's not what the question's asking. It's asking if there's a maximum, a minimum, or a neither at x equals 6. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in 6 and 5 into the second derivative. And we're going to get 6 times 0, because I already knew that the dy dx was 0, minus 5. Okay. And now, I think I'll start off with, let's say I hadn't said that equals 0. I would then need to say, what am I going to conclude? Is this going to be a maximum, a minimum, or neither? Maximum. Yes, it is going to be a maximum. So, I will say maximum... And now this alone would not be enough, because the idea is the first derivative is 0 and the second derivative is negative. I have declared really neither of those things. So I would say something like maximum because dy dx equals 0 and second derivative is negative. Okay? That would be my good solid justification. Okay? That's great. But there's a slightly faster I could also, kind of in line with my work, put in my justification. Say, hey, there's dy dx equaling 0. And hey, here's the second derivative being less than 0. And therefore, it's a maximum. That is sufficient. Okay? But we have to be very explicit about the fact that our derivative is equal to 0 and, the, and explicit about the sign of our second derivative. Okay? I just, I've got some people that will occasionally tell me, Okay, the second derivative is positive, therefore it's a maximum, without checking dy dx equals zero, and that gets you nothing. Okay, please don't do that anymore. All right, absolute extrema. That's something that happened on our recent test, but a lot of us, you know, kind of got the answer, but didn't get all of the justification points. Okay, and these are, it's, it's hard to gather all of the points, because there's a few things we need to be able to, to remember. And so, if they ask us to find the maximum value on a closed interval, which might have square brackets, or it might have the less than or equals, okay, then we need to run the candidates test, the closed interval test. And so that's where I'm going to be taking my x values of the endpoints and evaluating my function at those. And so I'm interested in maximizing g of x. Okay. And so I'm going to say, well, g of x is the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. And I know what the integral from 0 to 0 is. It's going to be 0. Then I can also do the integral from 0 to 10 of f of t dt. And that's where I'm going to say, OK, it's just the net signed area under the graph of f. So it'll be 19 minus 21. Maybe I'll actually write this out. 19 minus 21 plus 9 minus 2. And that's going to be, what is that going to be? Five, okay. Yeah, because I got negative. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I just really wasn't seeing that. Okay. But then I also need to consider the critical points. Okay. Now, the critical points are going to be 2, 6, and 8. 
but you need to give the reader a reason to believe that you know why you're selecting those points. Okay? You can't just choose those points at random. I graded a problem like this this summer, and there were people that would just do every integer or every place where there was the, the graph of f was 0, and maybe if they were given that x value, they would consider that one too. And they were just trying to throw stuff at a wall and see what stuck. Okay? And that's not good enough, right? We have to explain why are we interested in 2, 6, and 8. That would be because when we take the derivative of g, we get f of x. And I'm interested in where that's 0, because those are potential extrema. Zeros of the derivative. Also, places where the derivative fails to exist will be candidates, but that's not going to happen on this one because f is well-defined everywhere. This is going to give me x equals 2, 6, and 8. That's the kind of the reasoning. It could also be as simple as, especially if you've already declared that g prime equals f previously in the problem, something like g prime equals 0 and an arrow over to those values. I just need something to tell me why do you like those as candidates? And I think a lot of y'all got that message from me on the recent on the recent test. Why do you like these as potential as potential extrema? So at uh, x equals two, I'm going to go from zero to two of f of t dt, and that's going to be 19. At six, I'm going to go zero to six of f of t dt, and that's going to be 19 minus 21, which is going to be negative two. And then at eight, I'm going to integrate from zero to eight, and I'm going to get 19 minus 21 is negative 2 plus 9 is equal to 7. And now at this point, my job is to say, oh, look, here is the largest value. Okay, the maximum, maximum value is, and remember that if they ask for a value of g, our answer needs to also be a value of g. So it would be g of 2 equals 19 or just 19, but not x equals 2, and not the coordinate pair 2, 19. They seem to really not like coordinate pairs. Also, I had something else to say about this. Oh, you might be saying to yourself, hey, you want the maximum value, and x equals 6 is a relative minimum. Why didn't you just cross that one off? And the reason is, if you want to cross off x equals 6, you have to write a note saying why you crossed it off. Right? We have to justify our answer. And in justifying that, we would not only have to justify why x equals 6 is a relative minimum, which is g prime, which is f goes from negative to positive, we would also have to provide a remark about a relative minimum not being a candidate for an absolute maximum. And I think that it's just faster to evaluate the function at all of the critical points than it is to write all of those notes and, you know, hope for the best. I think that we'll just put all of the critical points in, grind through it, and then we'll know that we are leaving ourselves eligible for all the credit. Now let's talk about L'Hopital's rule. Now to just remind you of the rule, it says that if the limit of each of f and g is zero as we approach a, then the limit of their ratio is the limit of the ratio of their derivatives. And that the rule is really the cause for the reason that the readers are uh, the way they are. Or I am readers, so I'm why we are how we are. And the two things we need to remember is not to say things equal 0 over 0. So I'm going to say don't say equals 0 over 0. Never say that. Okay? 0 over 0 is not a number, so it can't be equal to anything. And then also don't forget to maintain limit notation. Okay. And so for example, and I'll just kind of show you what I mean by this. Find the value of the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x plus 11 divided by the integral from 4 to x of f of t dt if f is a twice differentiable function with f of 4 is negative 11 and f prime of 4 is 2 thirds. So we can't say that this equals 0 over 0, but in the one that I graded this summer, you are okay to say arrow 0 over 0. What I might recommend is separately describing them as going to 0. Now, f of x plus 11 is going to 0 because f is approaching negative 11 because it's a differentiable function, meaning it's continuous. Okay? The integral from 4 to x is approaching 0 because it's approaching the integral from 4 to 4, and we know that's going to be 0. So I'm going to say I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay. 
okay? And that's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 4 of the derivative of the top is f prime of x divided by the derivative of the bottom. That's why I'm going to take the upper bound and throw it in wherever I see the dummy variable. And that will be f of x. And now this limit is approaching, what is f of x is going to 2 thirds divided by f of x is approaching negative 11. And we could definitely leave it like that in a free response setting. Or we could combine that to make 2 over negative 33. And one thing I'll say about this arrow, that could be an equals. But a lot of people in my class have kind of like caught on that the safest thing to do is just to always use arrows in L'Hopital rule scenarios so that you're never caught equaling the wrong thing. And that's fine. But really, the only thing that you're not allowed to equal is 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. Also, the likelihood of infinity over infinity happening on free response is not good. Okay. So I think that's, you know, to highlight the things we're showing that it goes to 0 over 0, not equals 0 over 0, uh, painting our limit notation. And we should probably also mention that we're using the L'Hopital rule. Question. Question was, do we need to have more commentary on the integral from 4 to x going towards 0? And no, I think it's, it's self-evident that the integral from 4 to x of f of t dt approaches 0 as x approaches 4. Good question. Now let's talk about in a calculator active scenario, right? We need to be able to solve an equation, take a derivative, take an integral, and graph a function on an arbitrary viewing window. Those are the four things you have to be able to do for AP Calculus. But graphing the function, that's only to give you a sense of perspective or anything. It's never part of your answer. So these are really the three things that end up giving you an answer. And first, for solve an equation, this is an adjusted multiple choice question, but find the x coordinate between x equals 2 and x equals 2.5, where f has a horizontal tangent. And the important thing here that we do is that we describe the equation that we are solving using technology, that we don't just go straight to the x values. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the equation sine of x squared plus 1. Well, what am I going to set that equal to? If it's the derivative and I'm looking for the locations of horizontal tangencies, I want, yeah, I want the zeros of the derivative. So I'm going to say that's equal to 0. Okay. And then I'm going to bring out the calculator and I'm probably going to plug in sine of x squared plus 1 into y1 and just try to compute the zero of it. Anybody have that? Now, so we just pull out the calculator, and we are going to, in y1, we're going to type in sine, and when we hit that sine button, we're going to check to make sure we are in radian mode. And then we will sine of x squared plus 1. And I'll be interested in where that's zero between x equals 2 and x equals 2.5. Now I'm going to graph the thing, and hey, look, it happened right there. So I'm going to calculate a zero. Since there's only one of them, I could say the left bound is 2, and the right bound is 2.5. Give it a guess. And here I get it. Notice that it says y equals negative 3 times 10 to the negative 13. You have to know that that means zero. Okay. It's a little bit of round off error or something. I'm not entirely sure why it does that. You'd, might need to ask your physics teacher or somebody that understands electronics. Um, but I'm just going to report that that happens at x equals 2.299. And the important justification here is the equation that I solved. Okay. Now, if I'm interested in taking a derivative and an integral, I'm going to do this twice. Okay, So I'm going to type in the velocity function, 3 plus 4.1 cosine 0.9t. And then if I want to take a derivative, I hit math 8. So I want to take the derivative with respect to x of y call on using f4 or the variables menu right here at the point where x is equal to 4, because x is just kind of standing in for t in the calculator world. And I get okay, well, uh, acceleration is 1.633. But this answer is unjustified, right? We want to make sure that, you know, readers are a little suspicious. They 
are going to assume you just stole the answer from somebody else. And so what you do to assuage them of their fears is you're going to say, hey, I took the derivative of v and plugged in 4. I know we talked about this a little bit in the past couple of weeks, but I just wanted to you know, point that out again, that that's important. And for an integral, okay, if I need to find the total distance, okay, I know that to find an integral I'd use math 9, and the total distance on 1 to 4 is going to be the integral from 1 to 4 of the absolute value of velocity. Now I get absolute value from math and I scroll to the side, although I've also heard recently that it's available in F2. Okay, I'm going to take the absolute value of y1 at the time, or at with, yeah, between time 1 and 4 with respect to x. And it'll tell me that that value is 5.602. But again, this is not enough. This is unjustified. I need to tell the reader what I typed into my calculator. So I'm going to say the integral from 1 to 4 of the absolute value of v of t dt is equal to that that's the justification, and we just need to be careful when we're using a calculator. It's all right. Okay, separation of variables is the type of thing that I feel like we did pretty good on when we hit that unit. And we definitely didn't struggle with showing our work, but I think it's good to go back and review where do the points come from. So here's an example. This is where they say, find y equals f of x, the particular solution to the differential equation with the initial condition f of 0 equals 1 fifth. And so we remember that we have to get all of the y's over here and all of the x's over here. And then we take the antiderivative of both sides. So that's now probably realistically when you're working this, you're actually not doing that immediately you're probably saying 1 over y squared dy is equal to 4x to the third dx and we're going to need antiderivative of both sides of this equation and you know if it's a fraction I want you to rewrite it as a power when you're anti-differentiating so we get add 1 to the power and divide by the new power, it's not log of the absolute value of y squared, you know that, is equal to antiderivative of 4x to the 3. I'm going to add 1 to the power and divide by the new power, and I just get x to the 4. And I don't forget the plus c. Then I'm going to just start trying to access the y. So I'm going to say y to the negative 1 equals negative x to the 4th plus c. Remember, we don't really do algebra with plus c. So it just becomes a new c. And y to the negative 1, that's equal to 1 over y. So if I want to access just regular y, I'm going to say 1 over y is this, then y is 1 over this. So it's going to be 1 over negative x to the fourth plus c. But I'm not done. I need to use the initial condition of f of 0 is 1 fifth. So y equals 1 fifth when x is equal to 0. And that's telling me that c needs to equal 5. So in conclusion, my answer is f of x equals 1 over negative x to the 4 plus 5. Okay. And the way, and I'm just going to kind of copy in the scoring guidelines usually real quick. So this problem is typically worth 5 or 6 points on the free response. The first point is always separates variables, and they always have the note 0 out of 5, 0 out of 6 if no separation of variables, and that's pretty catastrophic. That's like missing a few multiple choice problems. Okay. No, 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 no. I was just, I'm just writing in gray so that the, the viewers online can see like where each point comes in and where I achieved each of the points of the arrow. And so I separated variables. I successfully anti-differentiated. Sometimes each antiderivative is worth one point, so it would, that would be where it's worth six. Okay. Sometimes the plus C and the uses initial condition get merged into one point. Okay. And then there's kind of a maximum, like in this case, it would be maximum two out of five if no plus C. Right. And because how can you find the value of C and get your actual solution if you don't ever have the C down on the paper? Now, I recommend. I know that sometimes they have a little bit of leeway, but I want to see y'all writing down the plus C as soon as you're anti-differentiating. Don't wait until a later step to be like, oh, wait, I got a plus C here. Because um, sometimes you'll have put it in the wrong spot, and sometimes you'll run afoul of the greater, right? We don't want to do that.
as soon as we anti-differentiate, that's when we're in incurring a plus C. Okay? Uses the initial condition, that's where we plug in on X and Y to try to find the value of C, and then solves for Y is getting Y equals. Not some sort of implicit thing like right here. That would, that would be an implicit formula for Y. 1 over Y equals X to the 4 plus 5. That, that's not going to get the job done. Okay? And I think that's all i got to say about separation variables. Right, now the last thing I've got for you is the point of inflection. And this isn't you know, super common. And when it does, I mean, it shows up on every exam, at least on multiple choice or free response. But when it shows up on free response, it's not worth a whole bunch of points or anything. But I feel like sometimes people are, end up trying too hard for the point of inflection. And so I just wanted to go back and talk about you know, justifying our answer for that. So, you know, again, the same graph, g of x is the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. What is, where are the inflection points on g? Well, we know that points of inflection are sign changes in the second derivative. Okay, so uh, it's going to be where g double prime changes signs. But to figure that out, I need to know what g double prime is. And in order to figure out what g double prime is, I need g's first derivative. So g prime is going to be f of x. And then g double prime is going to be f prime of x. Okay. So that will be any place where f prime changes signs, where the slope of f changes signs. So where the slope of f goes from positive to negative or negative to positive. And that's looking like here or there. And lots of times people want to say it's a direction change on the derivative or whatever. And that could be what you look for. But your reason when you're responding for your justification has to do with signs and derivatives. Okay? So I'm going to say at x equals 4 and x equals 7. And my reason would be because g double prime of x, which I know is f prime of x, changed signs. That's my reason. And I feel like the issue on, on this scenario is oftentimes that people are trying too hard. Um, you know, extrema of the derivative is definitely, you know, kind of a one that works. But they've got a list of words that work and a list of words that don't work. And rather than trying to remember which of the words are magic words and which of them are bad words, you just talk about signs and change the signs and second derivatives, right? That's going to be the thing to do for a point of inflection. Now, they can also pitch it to you algebraically, and I thought I'd behind you that. And I've got two examples for you, one polynomial and one uh, with some transcendental in it, that exponential. So the first step to figuring out the points of inflection is going to be compute the second derivative. So you should probably pause, work through, compute the second derivative using the product rule on f and just using the power rule on, on g, and then check your answer against mine because it's, it's about to pop up. And so you'll see on the left, I took the derivatives using the product rule. And then I combined the 2e to the x and the 2e to the, e to the x and made 4e to the x. And on the right, I just took the derivative twice using the power rule. That was easy enough. And now what we need to do is we need to make either a sketch of the second derivative or a sign chart for the second derivative. Okay? I think it's going to be much easier to sketch the derivative of a polynomial than something that's got x times e to the x. So I'm going to choose the polynomial to make the sketch and the one with exponential to make the sign chart. Either way, we need to factor these things and find where they equal zero. So I'm going to do that real quick for you. Okay, and now I'm going to kind of draw a little number line and plot each of the zeros of these second derivatives. Right? So one on the left, 2e to the x, that can never equal zero for any value of x. So that's not going to contribute any zeros. But 2 plus x can equal zero like where x is negative 2. Okay. On the right, x squared can equal 0 when x is 0. And x minus 12 can equal 0 when x is 12. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to get myself some numbers. Let's, let's that happen. Okay. I'll just move this guy here. Whoops. All right. Now, on the left, I'm going to do the sign chart. So I'm going to pick a number larger than negative 2, like 0. Okay. 
uh, greater than negative 2. And I'm going to plug in 0 into f double prime and determine whether it comes back positive or negative. 2 times e to the 0 is 2 times 1 times 2 plus 0 is going to end up being 4, which is a positive number. So I know that it's positive on that entire interval. Here where x is less than negative 2, I've got well, something like, I don't know, negative 10. So 2 times e to the negative 10. e to the negative 10 is a positive number. Multiplied by 2 is still positive. And then multiply that by negative 8, and you're going to get yourself a negative number. And so I'm seeing here a sign change in the second derivative, because this is f double prime, and that means it's going to be a point of inflection. But we know that on the AP exam, the reader cannot and will not look at your sign chart or your sketch of the graph, so we're going to need to kind of declare our answer. So I'm just going to say f has an inflection point at x equals negative 2 because f double prime changed signs. Right? It's not because the second derivative equals 0. If you say because the second derivative equals 0, you get no justification credit because there are places where the second derivative is 0 and it is not an inflection point, like x equals 0 on the right. Okay, So if I'm going to make a sketch of that, and I might also label this as the sign chart in case you were just like unsure what I was talking about when I was talking about sign charts. And this is going to be a sketch of the graph. Okay, I know what a third degree polynomial looks like. It kind of looks like that, right? And so I know it's specifically going to come from below and then finish going towards infinity. So I know it's going to come from below right here. And then when it hits zero, I've got a multiplicity two there on that x. So it's going to bounce and come back down. And then it's going to pass through confidently at x equals 12. And that also allows it to have the shape that we knew it was going to have. Right? It's going to come from below and go up at the end. Uh, and we needed to have that happen with only two zeros. That requires a balance. Okay. And so I'm seeing no sign change here at x equals 0, despite the second derivative equaling 0. And, a, but a real full-blown sign change here at x equals 12. So I'm going to say that g has an inflection point at x equals 12 because the second derivative of g changed signs. You don't really have to be any fancier than that, that we remember that that's what it means to be a point of inflection, and it's the best characteristic. I think that's all I got for you. You know, related to this, as we prepare for the semester exam, I'm going to have some videos like, you know, what are the formulas we need to know, like what must we know for calculus A, B, and also, what are some, you know, maybe obscure topics that we may have forgotten about and what's kind of a checklist of all the topics. And those will be, you know, probably linked right up there. So thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.